Hello and welcome to another classical music podcast. My guest today is one of my uh, dearest and oldest friends, a uh, colleague um, that I'm proud to call a friend. Andrew Swords is a violinist who has played on four continents with over 300 orchestras. Um, he is uh, a great example for me to look up to um, when I think about all the stuff that's involved beyond the practice room. Um, so please welcome Andrew Swords and uh, please join me today in picking his brain about all those things that are beyond the practice room. Well, thank you, Emil. I, and for those listening, I promise I did not pay Emil to say that kind introduction. So thank no, you. No, no. Uh, one of the things that um, ends up happening on this podcast, though, is that you kind of, um, I, I get a chance to thank the people with whom I have interacted, you know, for years. Um, and it, it surprises and embarrasses me that I didn't thank those people, including you, uh, before. So for the record, well, we go I back think... two decades, Emil. We go back 20 years. I mean, I recall, you know, me being a nubile violinist, really looking up to your successes in the contest circuit and um, your stories from Genoa and Brussels and all these other places and hearing what folks wanted to hear and what worked and what didn't. I mean, there's an which, which by the way, in turn, uh, I had to hear from Andrew Haveron um who gave me a kind of crash course in okay stop being stupid <laughs> <laughs> towards the the end of my competition wanderings but yeah that's really the reason for these podcasts uh that sooner or later someone does have to tell us those things that later on we forget we ever had to be told they, they sort of seem self-evident but in fact they did have to be learned mm -hmm. things like how do people listen in contests or in auditions and so on so actually, that's one of the things that I want to talk to you today. I can jump right into it um, in terms of listening. Um, so my credo gradually over the past couple of years of teaching has become that listening is everything. Absolutely. And it's I, even when you've got a, a tremendous amount of talent, we have to um, fine tune our ears as we go. You know, what we think works and sounds good at 20 might not work for us 10 years later, 15 years later. And it's these external influences that we meet, whether they're conductors or my favorite chamber music partners or inspiring pianists who really can set us on the straight and narrow when it comes to um, reining in our flights of fancy. Well, or, you it, know, it just, it's just essential to point out your education didn't stop when you graduated and got handed a diploma. My education might've begun. Begun. Actually on that, because that first year that I was out of school, Emil, um, I was traveling around and I had a couple of bucks in my pocket and I had these concerto appearances and I didn't know. I, I walked on stage in, um, actually on the West Coast with the Mendelssohn Concerto and I thought, I've got this whole year set. I know what I'm doing 18 months from now on a certain afternoon. And I started that particular, uh, the Mendelssohn Concerto, and I realized how very little I knew. What happened? I might have asked to restart it. In rehearsal. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know. And for, for the non-musician um, students and for their non-musician parents, uh, do you want to contextualize that? Like explain to them what it means to walk out on stage with a new orchestra and ask the conductor to restart? You know, it's a very brave thing that us musicians do, you know, to go on stage. And of course, we're not performing heart surgery and uh, removing tumors. But we are an essential profession, I believe, for, for the culture. I mean, yes, we are a luxury profession, you know. It's unfortunately right now, not everybody can get to the ballet or the orchestra or uh, chamber music series. We need to make it more available to the masses. But what we do is we go on stage and it's a tightrope walk. We've got this box of wood that weighs three pounds. We've got four steel strings. We've got a stick with horsehair, and we're expected to be uh, Cupid and Adonis and Zeus all at the same time, while interpreting the piece that was written in you know 1845 that will be around 145 years after I'm gone. And for 30 minutes, we have to be compelling enough for people to justify the babysitter the date night out, the parking fee, um, sitting in the hall. And of course, you know, pre-COVID, we thought nothing about it. I, I went to concerts, Broadway shows, symphonies uh, two or three times a week. And I think I actually took it for granted. 
the oh yeah the, the yeah the, I had the, in live music and now I won't take any of it for granted because I haven't sat in an indoor hall to listen to an orchestra play since March first of last year when uh, the Cleveland Orchestra did the Mendelssohn Reformation Symphony. Which, yeah, not taking it for granted is something that uh, one of the few silver linings of this entire 21st century plague. Um, the, the thing that I said about, you know, how listening is, is everything, um, I, I want to just explain to you what, what I have going on in my mind when I'm talking to a beginner. Because to a beginner, I'm not talking about being Cupid. Uh, and to a beginner, I'm not talking about even you know, projecting to the back row of a hall. To a beginner, I'm like, okay, the violin goes in the left hand, the bow goes in the right. But I came to realize that it's the same, um, one of our five senses, it's the same skill set that applies equally to a beginner and to the, you know, the A-list soloist. At the beginning, you're just reacting to, uh, am I playing the right note? It's a very basic listening um, and just because the teacher says, go ahead and play an A, how do you know that you've played an A if you're not listening to yourself? And then the listening becomes a little more refined. Fine, I played an A, but was that A in tune? You know, flash forward years of, was that A in tune? And then we get to the point of listening of, okay, fine, I played, you know, these particular notes in tune, I played these particular notes in rhythm, the out, outside uh, manifestation is, is in place. Did I phrase it at all or the way that I want it? And finally, you get to ever more refined, ever more subtle um, uh, feedback from listening. But and what does in tune even mean? Same. What does in tune even mean? Because it means something different to you, to me, to everybody else. And you, you reach even the pantheon, the Olympian violinist of yesteryear. And you, we think Oysterock and Highfoots and Sharing and Grumio all played in tune, and they did. They did. Their batting average was all over 99%. Yet... Let's take the opening to the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. You've got Heifetz, who might view intonation, you know, at 443, riding the pitch. And you might have um, Jacques Thibault, who might be a little riding under the pitch. And yet, somehow, it works. You know, it's, it's very subjective. I think it is subjective. I think it is very relative. Uh, again, something that I point out to beginners is that... Um, no one goes around memorizing what the perfect G sharp sounds like. No, uh, I'm still trying to find a perfect G sharp. If you locate one for me, please send it my way. <laughs> Have you noticed though that when you're trying different violins, uh, it's not about the string measurement; it's about the overtones. For sure, right? Um, so I I would like to talk about listening from not the perspective necessarily of the the student of the violin, but the student of other violinists when you go to a concert hall or when you listen to a recording of a legend of yesteryear, how do you, what are you listening for? How do you judge? You know, I like to think of myself as a blank slate. Um, I also have the unique experience as do you of someone who's stood up there and done that. So um, I'm rooting for folks. I want folks to play as well as they can under the pressure, which I'm sure they're feeling up there. You know, I'm one of those who's like, rah, 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 nail this third movement of the Brahms concerto, nail it to the back of the wall. And if flukes happen, they happen and I forgive it. And if they're habitual, then I don't forgive it as, as readily. Um, I like to see, if we're talking about a student, I like to see somebody with good taste, somebody who has thought a little bit about it. And this is coming from somebody who, I actually don't think I really started thinking about context of the composers and repertoire until I was in my 20s. But if I see a middle schooler, a high schooler who's done some biographical research, who knows what was happening in Tchaikovsky's life when he finally went to Switzerland and started penning this concerto that he wrote in 1878, you know, when, when there's context, when there's history, when there's empathy, when there's relatability, and when there's someone actually listening for a robust tone and a deep tone, not a surfacey, not on the string, but actually but in the in, string. Yeah. You know, the, the difference so many, between running your hand over your other hand or pulling the skin. So many times I've asked kids, you know, who, who do play well, but, you know, I, I hit under their elbow and I say, how much do you think your arm weighs? And they say, oh, Mr. Swords, maybe 12 pounds. I say, okay, well, then we need to hear 12 pounds worth. The violin will not break. 
trust me, we've had certain soloists who try and break their instruments at every concerto, a stop, and somehow it doesn't happen. Your violin will not break from the first. Although, I, I don't know if I told you in one of the contests that I, that I actually did towards the very end, that one of the finalists did break his violin. Boy. It was a Tchaikovsky concerto, and he caught the inside tip of the bow against the upper base seabound corner. Oy. And he tore the top quarter of the uh, violin off. Poor guy. Yeah. That's my word. That my stomach is tightening now hearing that. Yeah, I mean, you, it's like watching somebody get you know shot. Um, but you're you're describing how you judge. You know, when you're judging a student or a conservatory player. So let's talk a little bit about what you're hearing. How is what you and I hear different than what the <clears throat> the layperson hears when listening to Francescati? Well, or comparing, or sure. comparing Francescati's Brahms, let's say, with Stern's. Certainly, our ears are more attuned than the layperson's. And um, that's not necessarily because we were born more musically inclined than anybody else. I think it's because we've spent tens of thousands of hours fine tuning our ears. I really do. I really think that's what it comes down to because as, as kids we can, and I'm sure you've seen this before, you have no idea how these music students are going to turn out. You could have an average seven and eight year old making progress, some progress, and somehow at 15, they're winning every local contest and they're blowing folks away. And then of course, there's the other end where you have a precocious nine year old who at 19 is, is still playing like a nine year old woefully behind. Yeah. Um, so again, I like to see a little bit of class and elegance too, you know, and that doesn't really emerge until you've got a few dozen concerts under your belt, but, um, but, but, that, presum but presumably when you're listening to, let's say, um, Kogan and comparing him to somebody else of that era, let's say, you know, uh, Francescati versus somebody, you know, current, um, I, I, this is my belief. I don't know if this is actually, if this is verifiable, but I think that if you or I, or a random, um, uh, lay person were to listen to those three recordings, some of the adjectives that we would choose would line up. They would say that so-and-so so sounds classy. Hogan sounds so -so. electric. You know, yeah. Francis Scotty sounds, uh, like a country club gentleman smoking a cigar and, you know, um, and Sophie Mutter's recordings might sound um, a little hormonal. You know, we might come up with the same adjectives. Even though all these folks belong, as I said, on Mount Olympus, we've got, as you said before, we've got the, uh, the mortals, we've got the demigods, certainly. Yeah. And, and there's, uh, my, my teacher at uh, Manhattan School of Music actually had different tiers. There's the, you know, the gods, the, there's the demigods, there's, you know, the indisputables, Heifetz, Milstein, Oistrach. And then you have uh, this constellation of legendary talents who they are, what are they missing? We can debate this endlessly and, and never uh, you know, arrive at a solution, but And then there's... we've got comets. We've got comets that appear for two to five years and then completely fizzle out. Yeah. Again, we're not going to mention names, but I think you and I are probably thinking so several of the same names. Sure. Um, and what, of what course, there are others who, um, for whatever reason, you know, I think of Camilla Wicks, who was an A-list talent with the most round sound you can imagine. You know, I have a colleague who played with her, and he said when she tuned her instrument, it was so resonant, it hurt one's ears. Wow. And yet she took herself out of the industry for a decade to have five or six kids, Um but she was, uh, she had the favorite Sibelius recording for the composer himself. And, you know, her um, Beethoven concerto with Bruno Walter is, is absolutely legendary. So, yes, we've got all these talents that we know, and I'm sure you've seen them in summer festivals, too. You know, I, I remember going to the Encore Music Festival, which was the Cerrone's Festival, of course, from 1985. The, for, for people who don't know, David Cerrone. Uh, the former uh, head of the president, of yes. president, I should say, of the Cleveland Institute of Music. Yes. And these talents and I heard walking across the stage. And of course, you know, Meadowmount had everybody of a certain generation, you know, Laredo and Seinhardt and Rabe and, and uh, even going to uh, Bell. But then for those born half a generation later and beyond, Everybody sort of ended up at Encore at some point. You know, you've got Hillary Hahn and Lalo Josephowitz and 
Elisa Wallerstein and Stefan keep numerous others. And this talent that you heard walking across the chapel stage, you know, you've performed on that very stage. It's mind boggling. And in, in many it's ways, intimidating. Oh, you know, for, for sure. And it was a great education for me. It was a great education to see how kids could cope. I mean, Linda Saron had her 8 a.m. studio classes. And we think this is gymnastics. It is. Now you wake up at 6.30 in the morning from whatever you were doing the night before as a high school or a college student, running through scales, doing Sibelius, Prokofiev, Stravinsky, Concerti at 8 o'clock in the morning in front of the most talented peers out there. Let me tell you, I've never played for a tougher audience than those six years that I spent in Encore. Well, I, I will even think back to Juilliard pre-college um, and realizing even then, I, I was what, 10 years old? Uh, realizing even then that um, my first public performances were when I was 11 and they were scary, um, but playing in studio class, playing in master classes was terrifying. Absolutely. The, you know, every single person in that room knows what you're doing. They see right through your BS. And uh, even when they say, oh, no, that was really nice. There is almost nothing more eviscerating than a, a sort of pity compliment from somebody your own age who can, you know, play circles around you because you didn't see fit to practice. Or we think can play circles around us and then we leave school and maybe there's something compelling about how you do a certain sonata or, or a show piece that somebody else might not have. You know, these talents, I never compared myself with anybody else growing up. Um, or Let me rephrase that. I never favorably compared myself with anybody else growing up because I thought that, you know, the CD that I had of one Sarah Chang at age nine, who might be one of the most precocious prodigies of the last century, uh, who could compare themselves to that? But then you get a little bit older, a little more advanced, and you think, you know what? I might offer something. I might offer something compelling. I might turn a phrase here that makes this conductor think. That was interesting. And for the 30 minutes that I spent with this particular violinist, Andrew, it wasn't the worst 30 minutes of my life. Let's have him back in three years. And I think that that's how careers, maybe launching into another subject, I think that's how careers are born, is if you believe within your heart of hearts that there is something compelling, of course you have to have technique to back it up. You know, we can't make a career doing the accolade concerto. Although um, I, I would be very curious to see someone try. <laughs> the accolade slash Vuitton student concerto. Um, you know, we have to be able to get through Dvorak and Sibelius and Brahms and Tchaikovsky. But... At that point, if you can sway an audience to be on your side, I, I always think I'm sort of reciting. You know, I don't like when people say, oh, gosh, so-and-so sings through the violin. Anybody can sing through the violin. It's the closest thing to the human voice. Can you speak and say something? Oh, I had, I, I got to tell you this. Um, it, it's tangentially related, but I had this experience actually in Brazil at a festival <clears throat> where uh, I was trying to explain um, the phrasing in the Allemande of the D minor partita. And, you know, I, I explained, you know, the, the first phrase comes to an end here, the second phrase there, you know, here. And the, the student kept on nodding uh, when the translator said everything and then con continued playing exactly the same way. I said, okay, try this. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and, by opposing, end them. To do, and, and I went through the entire soliloquy. And the student, I, I saw the face kind of go. And then I saw the student pick up the violin and play a totally different Bach from mine, but one that made absolute sense. I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. And of course, we, we all have pieces speech. that come more naturally to us. You know, I can think of a couple of specific works that I've done a bunch that I think, you know, I like how I'm saying this. I like how I'm putting this across. And then you've got something like the Bach fugues or the Chacon or uh, maybe some of the um, more robust Isai sonatas. And we're always adjusting. We are. Oh, yeah. I was going through the B minor partita the other day, um, the Serbande and Bore, and I thought, why am I in a straitjacket? I know I can do this. Why don't I? There's. I don't have 100 people behind me, depending on me. I don't have 88 keys behind me waiting for me to land at the next bar. I've got all the time in the world. And I do know the rules. You know, there are some rules. I'm not an earlier than thou, but there are some rules to put earlier in. Earlier than thou. That's a new one. I like that. <laughs> to put in the cross Mozart or Bach. 
And then once you sort of allow yourself to have that confidence, sometimes we are our own worst enemies. Oh, absolutely. What, what you were and saying we earlier that- we can be that... confident. We can have nailed that opening of the Brahms concerto 19 times out of 20, and then something shakes us, something rattles us, we second guess, do I, am I really retaking that E? Am I going to do it on an up bow and then slur the F to the G sharp? Was I doing all the octaves on a down bow or just the top on an up bow? And then all of a sudden our, our brains interrupt and we are back as nine-year-olds. Yes. We're, we're learning the piece on stage in front of the audience then. Um, and You know, yeah. it's funny that we bring this up. I want to get this dream that I had off my chest. I, I don't think I even told my husband this. A couple of weeks ago, I had this very vivid dream. Those dreams where you wake up in a cold sweat and the sheets are sticking to you and you're just thinking, it's a good thing I'm in bed and not in the recording studio. Because I was in the recording studio with the very major orchestra and Pablo Yarvi recording the Prokofiev First Concerto, a concerto I've never performed. You know, and I, I've heard from so many colleagues about the traps, the memory trap at the end of the first movement, a couple traps in the uh, triplet scales in the scherzo. Oh, God. Uh, you know, it's just these mind, it's a minefield. It's a veritable yeah. minefield. And somehow here I am in this Abbey Road studio with Mr. Yarvi on a podium in front of me and a big name orchestra. And I'm sight reading the Prokofiev First Concerto with the live mic with the red light on across the room. And that's when I woke up in a cold sweat. Yeah. I mean, sight reading, no, but <clears throat> I remember my first time playing on BBC. Um, the microphone is at this distance, like arm length. Um, and what you were describing earlier, second guessing yourself, uh, learning the piece, like it was a piano trio. And yet I felt as though um, I, I was just learning to play the violin. Like every single thing was suddenly... You're second guessing. Um, You're in second position, and you might as well have been in Antarctica. And, and it doesn't feel like you're lost. You just feel like every little thing is audible. Every little thing is forever. Yes. Um, you are fearing every single step. And I think I probably realized then, but I only realize now that I realized then, that momentum is at the heart of technique. So much of what we do <clears throat> depends on being able to come from a place to a place, whether that's in phrasing or in a shift or, you know, bow speed. Uh, these are the, the, the practicalities of violin playing, but I'm sure that pianists have the same thing. Oh, if, you, if you nitpick, if you sort of wend your way through a piece, a note or a beat at a time, uh, it's infinitely harder. And for me, that's why I'm very particular about making sure I feel good on the concert day. I have the right food. I have the right nap. My colleagues are the ones I want there. You know, I'm getting old and curmudgeonly, Emil, and I don't really want to start working with new pianists because I have a handful of uh, wonderful collaborators at the Keys who just inspire me and make me more confident. And when you've got somebody like that who builds you up, builds you up and makes you feel better about the, your output, that's who you want to share a stage with. You know, I'm getting to the point where... Um, a series recommended a, a local yokel pianist. I shouldn't say local yokel, but I didn't know him from Sam. I said, you know, at 23, I would have said, of course. And now I, I think I'm too old for this. I'm bringing in somebody I adore. Yeah, and also <clears throat> also because uh, you can explain to the presenters uh, with the local pianist, even if they are absolutely ma magnificent, um, you need a couple of extra days of my time for, sure. for rehearsals. Yes. And, and, and you feel like you have your interpretation of the Franks now that we've done for decades, and we have to pull them along. We mm -hmm. have to, especially when they have a, a monumental piano part. You know, they've got 16 notes to R1 in the second and fourth movements, and yet we have to be convinced enough that they want to be on stage with us. It works both ways. I, <laughs> before we take this question, I'm just going to tell you um, a little story about playing with a new pianist. This was at a summer festival. Uh, the pianist was uh, an established and, and very, you know, fine pianist. Um, sorry about the ringing phone. Um, the uh, uh, audience is, of course, musicians. It's a summer festival uh, and music students. And Viktor Donchenko was in attendance. <clears throat> the pianist and I had not played together before, and the pianist's approach was more sort of old school Russian, where the tempi change frequently. So the second theme is a totally different tempo from the first and so on. But I remembered in rehearsals thinking, you know, I've always done it my way. I, I can do whatever I want on the violin. Let's do it the pianist's way. Let's try it. And I played it his way. And uh, Danchenko came backstage. 
and uh, you know gave me a hug and you know so great to see you and then proceeded backstage in front of people who spoke Russian to crucify me Oi. like you know of course now Emil you're you're no longer a, a student you 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 know uh, you're a, an established professional you, you play with authority but I categorically disagree you, you remember his categorically no uh, I categorically disagree uh, with the, the way that I played the Brahms. And the pianist is standing here, so I can't say to him, Viktor Markovich, it was an experiment. I, I wanted to try. Honestly, I'm not convinced, but I didn't categorically disagree. But, oh my goodness, just the idea of doing something a different way, one that you don't necessarily believe in, and then being called on it, I don't recommend it. Well, that reminds me of a conductor of an orchestra in the Pacific time zone um, that uh, during Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, this particular conductor said to me, well, this is different from the last soloist. And well, the last soloist did this here. So you're going to change that up. And I think I said, Maestro, if you want the last soloist, by all means, give her a call. <laughs> well, that, that does take a whole lot of audacity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we, we've got personalities in this industry for sure. Um, so first of all, I should also point out to um, any listeners that unlike uh, in the past, we now take questions throughout the podcast. So please do feel free to share your questions. They will come up on our screen and we will address them in the course of our chit chat. Uh, here we have from Rory. Can you share tips for recording music? considering how every single micro mistake is obvious should we tell should question, we tell Rory. them the the dirty little secret of the editing studio <laughs> you know i actually have never produced an edited recording rovery before um i am all about one take and that also lends itself to um criticisms because of course if you toss your hair a certain way and stamp your foot a certain way and end with a up a flourish a certain way visually it can be very deceiving it can de uh, deceive the listener from what is actually coming out of the instrument not that one is a charlatan but if one is having a less than pristine night <laughs> there are visual effects now for recording um i i just had a recorded performance due to covid back in january and this was at the Ravini festival in chicago and there was no editing allowed we had to do a recital, there was no editing. We could retake an entire movement, but um, your question about how every micro mistake is obvious. I like to have an audience member. I like to have somebody I trust, somebody who's on my side. You know, if you can get the sound engineer and, hey, Joe, what are you doing afterwards? Beer and a pizza sounds great. They're on your side, they're listening attentively. All of a sudden the energy in the room changes. Instead of going from, I hope I don't screw up the shift, it's, I'm putting this across because there's somebody listening to me and enjoying this. All of a sudden, the recording is that much better. I remember the Guarneri Quartet used to, uh, well, I wasn't present for this, but I've read Seinhardt's books. They would invite spouses and mistresses and kids and, uh, you know, dog walkers into the recording studio so that they had an audience. Well, actually, they had the, somebody to play for. The man, the man with whom I studied at the Manus College of Music, Alexander Chorus, who uh, was uh, an established radio violinist, meaning he was a soloist on NBC radio for years. The man actually did a live broadcast once weekly, never repeated a piece Gosh. for years. Um, and uh, uh, then he um, got cancer of the jaw. Uh, he had surgery back in the early 70s and was unable to play again, but uh, continued working in music uh, at Jacques Francais' violin uh, shop. Uh, and subsequently uh, at Manus College of Music. So he, um, first of all, <laughs> he was all about the do it differently each time. Um, he was the ears for um, somebody like no less than Yasha Heifetz and Isaac Stern. Um, so what they would do is literally have him drop everything, go into the recording booth with the recording engineer. So while his name would not appear on the credits, it is to him that Stern would turn after a take and say, what do you think? We need somebody like that. Yeah. yeah. And somebody whose ears you trust absolutely. Although I do, I do also remember uh, Alexander Kora, Sasha. I remember him coming for dinner one night. This was, um, I guess this had to be like 92, 1992. He passed in 94. Um, 
and uh, Fritz Chrysler's, maybe you can speak to this, Andrew, Fritz Chrysler's uh, collected recordings had come out um, on CDs back in what, early 90s, right? Something like that, yeah. And Sasha had spent my Manus education telling me about, you know, Fritz Chrysler, the, the master of delicacy and sophistication and urbanity and so on. And uh, I put on Chrysler playing Chrysler at dinner. And Sasha stops eating and starts listening and finally says, who is that? And I said, it's, you don't recognize? It's your old friend Fritz, whom he did, by the way, know personally, right? He had been born in 1901. Um, and he kept on listening. He goes, you know, it's weird. I, he didn't say weird. He said, it's odd. I don't remember him playing this out of tune. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but as to the, the recording uh, of a performance versus a recording of um, a CD, a recording that's going to, you know, go down as your definitive word on something. What is your, are you still anti-editing for that? I could probably be talked out of it, or if it's edited, I wouldn't want to know. Um, because I, I'm a firm, but I'm also not a recording artist. You know, I, I like going on stage 50 times a year and doing what I have to do and then forgetting about it. I don't want to listen to myself afterwards. I, it's, I cringe if I have to listen to myself. I've only enjoyed my playing a handful of times when I've listened back to it. Um, on the other hand, listening to oneself um, in the rehearsal process, especially with a piece you don't know as well, is really illuminating. If you can get past all the things that you don't care. You know, the first time I did the Archduke Trio, which was only a couple of years ago, I, I just put it off and put it off and put it off because I didn't want to sound like a kid doing the most heavenly of all yeah. piano trios. Um, you know, for those who are not aware, this is Beethoven's, uh, the piece he played actually the very last time he appeared in public as a pianist in 1814 was with his Archduke trio. It was later in life that he, he penned it. And I just didn't want to make the composer roll over in his grave. And during the entire rehearsal process, you know, you listen back and you think, well, maybe this is actually sounding a little bit more accomplished than I thought, or let's take out that shift because that's egregious. Yeah, I mean, the the kind of stuff that you don't notice as you're doing it, that you notice on the playback, um, a little humbling, but definitely essential. Oh, yes. um, for those that, that don't know about the recording process for you know all time, um, Glenn Gould, the great, the legendary uh, you know Bach expert, uh, became a full-time recording artist precisely because he had a different view of his job to yours. I, I'm, I'm hearing you speak and I'm thinking uh, that your approach is a little bit like the, the Buddhist monks making a mandala, you know, that it is beautiful and part, part of its beauty is its transience. Yeah. Right. It's, you know, it's... I, I'm, I enjoy the process of, especially if you've got three different concerto appearances in a week, you know, Thursday goes a certain way, Friday goes a certain way, and you don't really want to justify the differences to anybody else, at least, a little, uh, you know, most of all yourself. Um, so during the process of listening, you know, I had to listen to myself after this um, Rubinia recording and I enjoyed much of what I did. And there were some things I wish I could go back and do. And then you pour a glass of wine and it's on to the next thing. Yeah. It's just it's a snapshot of time. It's, look, it's like looking at a photograph and you think I really like that outfit or dislike that haircut or any other particulars. But at that time, this, this is you know, a snapshot in time as well as just, you know, uh, a flashback, right? Certainly. Um, so I think this is for somebody like Gould. He did two recordings, uh, two uh, legendary recordings of the Bach Goldberg Variations, an enormous piece of music. Um, one from, what was it, 55, 1955, and one from 1980. Um, and they are different, very different. They, they do reflect, you know, 35 years of musical, I won't say evolution necessarily, but musical thinking i remember um, bringing up with the serones that i thought michael rabin's caprices were less than yeah ideal because they are not immaculate mm -hmm. and at that point i was told the story about galamian calling rabin into a studio and saying young michael there are a couple of things that happened in this caprice why'd you leave it and rabin said oh, mr galamian i ran the caprices once before lunch and i ran them once after lunch we just took the better take and knowing that, you know, um, there are stories of Anne Sophie Muda, her very early recordings in the late 70s with Carrion in Berlin, where she's got two concertos to put down in the course of one afternoon. 
which makes them potentially live recordings. And yeah. unless something catastrophic happens, that's what's on the record. And I love that. It makes you sound, you know, I grew up on her third and fifth concerto recordings. She was 15 years old. The third orchestra she ever plays with is Berlin. The fourth is Vienna. You know, and it, it's the first, I believe, was Munich Phil, and second was the English Chamber Orchestra. That's quite a trajectory that no one else probably has equaled. Um, but you listen to this and you really feel like you're in a concert hall with uh, a young Wunderkind, an older statesman at the podium, and the most legendary orchestra in the world, most revered orchestra, certainly. It, it's definitely the immediacy of live performance. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that there are arguments to be made in favor of not just, you know, ironing out all the imperfections, which the, the editor can do, literally a segment of a note. You don't even take out one note. You can take out the mid part of the note where, you know, you scratched. Um, you know, there, there is something to be said for, okay, I would like my last word on the subject, you know, the defense rests word on the subject to be this um, in terms of, you know, re-examining re phrasing in terms of, uh, you know, changing uh, aspects of interpretation, not just in terms of cleaning up messes. But like you say, um, I've always told my I, colleagues, if we can get it, if we could get a perfect take in two takes of this piece, we're doing a good job. Oh, yeah. Because that's how I feel. I, I really feel that um, in order to go on stage, if you can get that ideal take with two performances of it and allowing for something small to happen in one, you're doing pretty well. Yeah. Um, but like you say also, uh, I don't think that I would be able to point to more than a handful of performances um, where I can say, you know what, what went wrong is inconsequential enough that it doesn't you know, embarrass me or, or make me think twice. Certainly. Um, it, it is definitely tough. And maybe it's good for us. Maybe it does build character, as our great grandparents said. Maybe it's like walking six miles uphill in the snow with no shoes to listen to yourself play the Mozart B flat sonata or something, or, or Mozart, the opening to the Turkish concerto. Well, it's it, it's a different experience when you're doing it compared to when you're listening back to it. Oh yes. Uh, and the you know the number of sound engineers who have uh, told me, listen, to you this particular you know whatever looms large, but listen to the entire movement and see if it jumps out at you because it, you yes. know. Um, but let's actually talk about uh, that whole aspect of, uh, you know, the, the industry, the, the performing life, uh, what it involves, how you are, um, how you have to spend your days as... Um, uh, you mean pre-COVID? Yes, I mean, mean pre-COVID, but I also mean hopefully post-COVID. Yes. Well, what do you want to know? Well, the the idea, let, let's take the mistaken, you know, the, the myth. The myth is that, um, you know, the orchestra musician practices, uh, goes and rehearses, plays the concert, and that is the extent of their job. Um, the myth for a soloist is that we sit in the practice room for eight hours a day, every single day. Um, and, uh, you know, as a child, you look sadly out the window while your friends are playing soccer uh, and you are there practicing, you know, accolade. Um, Leaving aside the, the childhood training, let's talk about the grown-up day for a, a self-employed soloist. So you're your own boss. That's, that's the plus. You are doing what you love. That's the plus. But walk us through what Well, I've never been one is. to follow rules. You know, I, going back to my childhood, uh, I had cassettes, which for the kids out there, these came before CDs and they came before iPods and they came before streaming music. Little cassettes. And I had a cassette of Itzhak Perlman doing the four seasons. And I would put it into my stereo, my boom box. And I would read a Hardy Boys novel, cover to cover. And I'd go downstairs. My mother would say, I'm so proud of you for practicing. Go outside and play. Because I lived across the street from a baseball field. And, you know, this is back in the pre-9-11 days when all the neighborhood boys and their dads would be throwing a ball outside until the streetlights came on. It was, you know, the bucolic 1990s. And I remember thinking to myself, my mom can't tell the difference between my little half size and Perlman. Um, so yes, I've never been one to follow the rules. And I don't think I, I have so much as an adult. You know, I. what's very important to me is when I'm at home, I'm really at home. I'm, I'm very, I don't cook, but I'm a domestic creature. I, I clean often. I like being outside in the yard. Um, I like uh, pre-COVID, you know, trying a new bar. 
uh, with various cousins that live in town or dear friends, going to the orchestra. My husband works for the Cleveland Orchestra, so we're there every week. Um, and those are my priority. And then when I go on the road, I sort of put on my performer's hat and everything becomes a little more focused. Um, the time, uh, whatever interviews that happened in the lead up, whatever uh, encores I think would be appropriate, I'm, I'm frantically learning. And also um, budgeting my time for the following week because it's never, if, let's say, for example. Um, let's say you're on tour for uh, a three week short, you know, relatively short tour. Mm -hmm. um, and if I've got Sibelius and Dvorak and um, Scottish Fantasy, uh, then I am doing a lot of practicing because they're, they're tremendously awkward. Um, if it's something like the Mendelssohn trios, taking those out on the road, there it's less taxing. So there's obviously less solo work, but there, as you know, um, no day repeats itself. There's no groundhog day in this industry. Um, there might be a, an early morning drive time interview. There might be a 10 PM zoom call with uh, somebody across the globe. And that's one thing that I think you just have to be adaptable in this industry. You have to adapt to the colleagues, to the conditions, to the climate and how your own instrument sounds. You know, pianists well, say, well, violinists get to bring their own instrument. Yes, but the instrument sounds different in St. Martin than it does in Denver. And what do you do when you're playing somewhere? Uh, I remember uh, my fiddle opening up a scene when I was playing at the Newport Festival. And it's not like I'm out in the boonies. I'm in you know Newport, Rhode Island. Yeah. And yet the closest dependable violin shop is Boston. Oh, yes. You know, so all these things we have to adapt. Um, I found myself becoming very good at time management. When I'm on for the job, whether it's the email, the phone call, the interview, or the rehearsal, I'm on, it gets all of my attention. And when I'm off, the phone is off, the violin is on vacation in a different part of the house. But talk talk to the, uh, especially to the, the students, you know, the, the aspiring young players, uh, talk to them about, you know, when, when you're not being a domestic creature, when you are working, what does a work day for a soloist entail beyond practicing? They know about practicing. Certainly. What don't they know? So for every gig, let's say that um, the year before COVID, I had about 55 engagements. And for all of those engagements, there are about 55 different emails that come in. And some are- Per, early, not 55 not, total. 55 per, emails per engagement. Absolutely, right. per. And you know, we hope that the ideal work trip involves no canceled planes and the correct name at the hotel reservation and a warm dressing room backstage, which even at the nicest halls is not always a reality. Um, and so the email correspondence, the rehearsals with the pianist, because I'm, I'm, old, I'm old school. I like to run through the concerto with the pianist before I take it on the road, about a week before. I, I have a very trusted colleague in town, and I ask her, is this working? Is this clear? And if she says something is not, then I know it's not right. If it's ready to go, then it's probably ready to go. Um, and of course, there's the uh, the emotional side of things. You want the orchestra to be on your page. You want the conductor to agree with what you're doing. And you want the reviewer to sum it up in a public fashion that what you did was worthwhile. But in preparing for being on the road, uh, you started talking about, you know, for 55 engagements, there's 55 emails a piece. Yeah. Um, so walk the the young player and their their parents through what even obtaining an engagement entails sure there are any number of ways to secure a gig one is you know the conductor conductor joe smith had hired you five years ago to the uh to do the brook concerto and he's been promising for the last few years that you can come back and do the Vuitton seventh concerto in a minor the one that nobody knows and you say sure it's in the books here's the fee here's the week we're good to go that's one third of the gigs um, another way is um, word of mouth. Joe Smith, conductor Joe Smith, told conductor Jane Johnson across the country, who we went to grad school with, gosh, you know, this guy um, came and he did a nice job and try it sometimes. Actually, that worked out for me for this fall. There's a conductor who I've been talking with for 15 years. And finally, just this fall, something's working out. But I have a very zen approach to this, Emil. I think, you know, the right time is now. When the gig happens, that's the right time for it to happen. There were some gigs that I wanted for a decade. For instance, the national anthem for my hometown, Cleveland Indians. 
I pestered them. I did everything but drop off biscuits and cookies at their front doorstep. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm a baseball nut for the Indians. That's what I, I don't watch primetime TV during the baseball season because I support my guys. Not last year because we didn't have a season. But finally, uh, four years ago, they asked me to play the anthem, and it was at a sold-out game. And then that went well, and they asked me to come back for the playoffs, and that didn't happen because the Yankees came to town and knocked us out. But um, word of mouth is one way. And then, of course, there are cold calls. You know what? I'd like to come in and play with you. And guess what? But, but to, to make that clear to, again, the parents and the students, the cold call isn't incoming. It is outgoing. Yeah. And this happens at all levels of the industry. This has happened for, you know, Mr. Berenbaum. I've got this young uh, pianist named Yuja. And would you give her a listen? All yeah. the way down to the... Uh, the Lake Erie Junior Symphonia Western Philharmonia of the Eastern Counties, you know, and not the, knocking the, the University of Southern North Dakota at Hoople. Yes, and not knocking community orchestras. Believe you me, if you no, get through one of the things Barbara where, Trudeau, where I love American, you know, musical life, the, the American musical industry, is the sheer size of the country means loads of orchestras. Yes. Um, you know, at every level. Yes. Um, of course, then we should talk a little bit about like, okay, so when you get a, a gig with, um, a frankly, not very advanced, not very strong orchestra, what's a good concerto to do? Mm -hmm. I have my thoughts, but I want to hear yours. Yes. Um, versus, you know, you get your big break with um, a relatively major or downright major orchestra. How do you not mess that up? Because we can also, without mentioning names, talk a little bit about well-known soloists who can play like nobody's business. Uh, coming in for their first gig with a major orchestra and it becomes their last gig with that major orchestra. And it, it's also in how you present yourself and how you get along. You know, so many of these conductors, let's be real, these conductors have a very short list. They have the, uh, if they're going to work with five violinists in a year, four of them are the established folks that they've worked with mm -hmm. in the past, that they like, that they get a drink with afterwards. They know the spouses and the kids and the backstory. And then they'll re reserve a week for a new contest winner, a precocious person, or word of mouth, a recommendation. And it, we are one small part of that season's pie, uh, the, the slice of the pie. And we've got to show up and we've got to go to all the receptions. We've got to, you know, did <laughs> one week. Oh, my goodness. But this orchestra where they put me on every drive time radio interview. And I'm not a morning person. And at 5.15 in the morning, I'm up trying to be enthusiastic about the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, the crown jewel of our literature, but at 5.15 in the morning, mustering this enthusiasm day after day, when you had an 8.30 p.m. rehearsal and drinks following, you know, there are, there are elements of this industry where you've got to be able, and I've got this gift, you've got to be able to fall asleep as soon as, you're, as you get on the airplane or as soon as you get in the car. Yeah, absolutely. You, you catch your wings when you can. Yeah. <clears throat> the, the last tour right before... Uh, COVID hit when I went up to Canada very briefly and saw your uh, name on the same, it was some concert somewhere up in, oh God, near Toronto, I remember that. Um, but basically I was doing uh, the Vieton Grand Sonata, which that's a story. I'm afraid um, of. And uh, some Schubert and, and uh, the Tsigan on this program. Um, I think we had a flight the previous day and the pianist, snapped a photo of me in the airport. My head is at a 90 degree angle back. Of course. And I am like, the, the violin case is across my knees like a, a table and I am out, I am gone. Uh, it, it's probably seven in the morning and I have to play in a couple of hours and you know, yeah. Whatever we do to feel good for that concert. I like sushi, I like Red Bull. Red Bull, if you're listening. I like bananas. You know, um, I like getting in the hotel pool and moving my arms and legs. And because that is really, we get so wound up. And some folks um, do yoga and Pilates. I think weightlifting is about the worst thing you can do as a street yeah. player. So I like going in the ocean or going in the pool and just flopping around like a fish for an hour. And I mean, it's it's not, uh, again, for the the practice addicts, the ones who think that any moment they're not in the practice room is a moment wasted. It's not um, self-indulgence. It is uh, getting yourself into the mental state you'll need for when you're actually playing. You know, I don't know any soloists who practice eight hours a day. I don't think I, 
you go on the road, you've got this crazy hamster wheel of a schedule, and you might be very efficient. You might be able to relearn a concerto in, in 90 minutes, and that's all you need. And any more than that, it could be detrimental. I don't know any peers, colleagues that, that practice eight hours a day willingly on a concerto, unless, you know, let's say uh, the, the Hinostera concerto, somebody cancels and you have to go the next week. Maybe... Maybe that's a reason. Well, you know, I mean, when I had to learn the Cachaturian Concerto in 10 days and perform it 10 days after starting to learn it, yeah, I was practicing, I won't say eight hours, but I was practicing basically with breaks only to eat. Yeah, I mean, I've the most time that I've spent in the practice room was certainly an undergrad. And that's because that's what you, we did. But that's also when you're acquiring the repertoire. Yeah. But later, when you are recalling the repertoire already acquired, it's a very different job than acquiring it in the first place. Yeah. And it's not like we're doing um, random uh, Szymanowski's 14th concerto in G flat um, every season. We're learning something like that. You know, when it's a, when it's a concerto you've done 35 times, it requires less work. And maybe yeah. that's a good thing. Maybe if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Go with what is working. You know, yeah. I'm not a I'm not a big believer in for publicity or for an effect. Let's change how we've been doing something that's working. You know, I there are some folks in the industry who feel like they have to expunge this perfect image of their plane that they've developed over ten years with the most elegant refinement you can imagine, and then they come out with something that is actually kind of ugly because they're sick and tired of doing the same old thing. But if it ain't broke. Well, not only if it ain't broke, but you might be tired of doing the same old thing, but the audience that is hearing you hasn't heard you do that same thing, yes. right? Uh, I sometimes will point my students at uh, people like Anna Russell or Victor Borga, because these are legends of the comic side of the industry who came up with a bit and stayed with that bit essentially for 40 years, unchanged, word for word. And you think of... Emmanuel Axe and Radu Lupu and Mitsuko Uchida. And they've been doing this for 40 years with elegance and refinement every step of the way. Yeah. And there's something to be said for that. You know, if I have to hear one more time that uh, one of those three that I just mentioned is not to their taste because it's the same level of excellence every night, well, then stay home if you don't want to support it. But nobody else is getting reaching those kinds of heights. I, and I think so it's, maybe, maybe Heifetz or Milstein in the violin world because Milstein sounded great for five decades, six decades uh, until yeah. until his last performance, and even then, yeah, it's and that simply doesn't happen when you're a string player the way it can I, when you're a pianist. I think the the difference being that um, if you think you're going to play exactly the same, that's not true. Even if you are uh, Radu Lupu, um, you're going in with the same aesthetic. You're going in with the same sort of metrics for what what qualifies as good taste versus bad taste. But, you know, even his performance on a Thursday night is going to be different than his performance on Friday. Absolutely. Were it not so, he would not be an A-list artist. He would be uh, a, a walking, you know, stereo. And there are external factors. How sleepy are you? How revved up is the audience? Uh, what kind of piano for them? What kind of piano are you playing on for us? What kind of, uh, like you said, temperature, weather, et cetera, is affecting the fiddle? You know, you can walk on stage and if you sense, even in the full house, if you sense that it's crickets and they're sleepy, Forget it. Your confidence is shot. If you walk out there and they're, uh, you know, uh, where were we? Um, British Columbia. And, um, I was working with a wonderful pianist, very beautiful lady. And she had, I'm a big believer in changing outfits during intermission and just it's theater. And she came out in the most incredible red carpet dress and the audience lost their minds for 60 seconds. It was great because when you get that kind of reaction, you feel like you can do no wrong. I actually, I think I told you this story about, um, Paganini competition breaking my string backstage. Is that before Sibelius Concerto? Um, no, that was before Paganini. Boy. Sayaka Shoji was playing Sibelius, a flawless Sibelius. Um, and as I'm standing in the wings waiting to go on and thinking, oh crap. <laughs> um, you know, and I have to go on and play uh, Paganini um, as the fiddle's tucked under my arm, the E string breaks. So, you know, I don't know if you've ever played Carlo Felice, but it, it's a warren backstage. You have to take an elevator to get to the dressing rooms. All right. So I, I know that the judges have not been told of my little predicament. All they know is that I'm making them wait. So presumably they're getting really ticked off. Um, and the, um, you know, the Paganini Concerto is largely on the E string. It is about the stratosphere. So when I walked on stage uh, with a freshly 
put on string, you know, looking at a, at a jury that I'm fearing might be hostile. Um, as the orchestra starts, I crossed my fingers. The front 10 rows noticed it and burst out laughing. And all of a sudden I was just, as we say in Russian, in my own saucer. I, I was like, you know, I don't care. I just, I like this piece. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to romp through it. Probably the best Paganini that I've done. You know, and contrast that with the same competition some years later, um, <clears throat> where it was just the reverse. The Brahms concerto, I walked out, I didn't want to play. Uh, I had already sort of exhausted myself practicing, you know, eight hours a day, like you said. And um, as the oboe comes in, just the fact of how gorgeous this piece is occurred to me. I remember the hair in my arm stood up. I remember I was suddenly electrified and I, I again, did not care about the audience. I did not care about the jury. Again, I played the best Brahms of my life, probably, um, with the audience applauding after not just the first, but after the second movement um, and refusing to stop. And glory, right? I, I walk off stage, I think I got this, and the next night I come out and I'm supposed to play Paganini. And for whatever reason, although I had played Paganini more often than Brahms, it didn't feel like a friendly audience or it didn't feel as sort of I am in my element or I just love this piece. And I was questioning every single thing that I did. Probably it's funny how these external influences really can shape how the con how the concert goes. Yes, we we are very much responsive to environment mm -hmm. as performers, which is why, by the way, I think the the whole COVID performing performing uh, virtually is not it's not a replacement. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And no shame to our colleagues who were um, submitting stuff every day from their family rooms, but it was not something I was interested in doing. You know, I, I actually didn't mind the quiet for the first few months of it. Um, I missed out on the musical com camaraderie. The collaborations. Yes. Absolutely. But there's, there's nothing like the real thing. You know, when we're watching a performance on YouTube, sometimes we're completely engaged, but other times we have vanity fair coffee, the email account, um, Joy Bayer on the view yelling at something Trump said. The, the luxury of being able to hit pause. Yes. Instead of having undivided attention. So I, I said to my publicist a year ago, I'm not doing living room concerts. I'm just not. Um, now I've done a couple of virtual streaming concerts from someplace as beautiful as Trinity Cathedral here in Cleveland. That's different for me, but I didn't want to attempt to replace something by you know doing the Frank Sonata from my dining room table. Yeah, and even if it's not your living room, which you get into acoustics and the quality instruments there, but the feedback from the hall, when you're doing Frank, you can feel the audience. Yes. I, I don't know how better to describe it, but I, I'm glad to see I'm not alone. You can feel the audience. Gosh, no. Um, Rory has another question, um, and this is the one that you probably get asked most often. How to gain more confidence in my fingers and hands. They tend to go against my will in serious performance times. Well, you might not like my answer. Scales, arpeggios, and whatever piece you're playing. Let's say, for example, that I have Brahms and Turtle that week. Admittedly, it's difficult. There's a lot of sound production. There's a lot of uh, strength that goes into it. Back muscles, um, staying in the string for 45 minutes. Um, there's a lot. If you are working on an etude, like for instance, these don't and Locatelli's and Isai, the prelude. Day. Um, most of these um, caprices are tougher than the actual concertos that we're doing. And if you pick one of those as your focus that week, everything else seems easier, I promise you. So for example, again, if I'm doing the Brahms concerto, I might take the last movement of Isai's first sonata. And it's got some finger busting tenths and triple stops and awkward string crossings. And then you get to the Brahms third movement and hopefully you've been doing the metronome work because you can't shy away from that. You, you know, you can't be so confident that we neglect to do the basics. Um, there's big time soloists who I've known for a couple of decades. And I remember saying to her, how do you learn something as challenging as Sibelius third movement, Brahms third movement, Dvorak third movement um, in a few days? And she said, you put the metronome on at half tempo and you just do it and you don't raise the speed. You know, it's funny, and I'm sure Emil can vouch for this too. If, if I'm in a masterclass and somebody is 
going through passage work. And it's mostly approximate, you know, it's not violist level where the fingers never strike the same point <laughs> twice, but you know, it's fairly approximate. I'll say, let me hear you do it a little bit slower. It is exactly the same tempo the second time. And I say, no, is too fast of a tempo to practice that the week before. You really break it down and you really see the anatomy of the shift, the anatomy of the bow change and what's working and what's not working. And if you give yourself three days to solve the technical problems, um, assuming you've already learned the piece, because I'm not saying that you're going to. No, you're talking about polishing in three days. Um, I remember seeing a class once with Perlman where he liked to say, the faster you learn something, the faster it leaves your hands. And there's yes. a lot of truth. To it's that. like, it's like cramming for a test. And uh, there were days where I would be watching dancing with the stars on mute and going through the Beethoven concerto cadenza or uh, the Barber concerto third movement. And you just have to do the repetition so that when you can find the orchestra, you go, I've done this. I put the metronome at 54 and work my way through this. And my hand knows what to do because the goal is you need an element of muscle memory for yeah. the concertos to work. You absolutely need to be able to shut your brain off and trust that this knows where to go. I, I will, I will follow up on that actually with two points. The muscle memory is something that everybody knows, but almost no one really does. We all, this is to answer the, the question. We all have a vulnerability that we stop doing the repetition before the muscle memory has been properly imprinted or fully imprinted. Um, and then when you walk out on stage and adrenaline or fear takes over, the lack of that last bit of absolutely reliable muscle memory really tells first. Um, and second, when you are, um, but when you are uncertain on stage, when you're messing up on stage, one of the things that's going wrong is your own brain saying, you know, you don't deserve to be here. You know that you don't. Oh, the imposter this. syndrome. The imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome that might pop up here. Yeah. So what, what Andrew just said about, you know, when you can flick that imposter right the heck off your shoulder because you're like, no, you're wrong. I do know this. I have done this 15 times in a row with the metronome set at 54. Mm -hmm. I can do this in my sleep. The, the feeling of calm that comes from you can set your hands to autopilot is tremendous. That said, um, of course, other kinds of memory are necessary. Other kinds of, uh, you know, pr pr preparation and practice are necessary. But if you find that you are telling your finger to, you know, to do one, three, four, two, four, and you keep on doing one, three, four, two, well, that's muscle memory that's lacking. Sheer repetition. Scales and arpeggios, scales and arpeggios. I mean, the toughest concertos that we play are based on scales and arpeggios, mostly in D major or D minor. For um, a reason, we should point out. And you want to point out that reason? Well, it's the most resonant. Exactly. You know, we don't have, how many pieces do we have written for us in F major other than spring and autumn? It's it's very few for a reason. Yeah. Or B flat. Or, or B flat is not, it's not so much of a problem, but good God, the Mozart clarinet quintet. The opening to the Spring Sonata. The opening, the opening to the Beethoven Second Romance. You know, I so many ways to go from the F to the A, the major third, and the B flat. Everybody has a different definition of where B flat should land. Yeah, but one of the things that scales and arpeggios will do is that, in addition to your hands, you are calibrating your sense of hearing. So where yeah. where we started really, where our conversation started today about listening, is a, a good you know full circle to come. The um, self-perception um, that tells you a note is sharp or flat is fallible. It, it can be wrong. And what you are doing with scales and arpeggios is reminding yourself of what true north and true south and east and west are. Um, if you don't give yourself that time, if you lunge in the practice room straight into playing your pieces, even if they are slow, you are probably ingraining the same um, inaccuracies or unre unreliabilities. And for those students listening, I'm going to offer a different perspective on what technique is, because so many times we think as fiddlers that technique would include double harmonics and tense up and down the fingerboard or a pianist, you know, cascading double octaves. That's not technique. Technique is not the extreme level to the, the peak at which we play. Technique is the lowest level that we will play on any given day because we've done the work. 
that's, technique that's, is not having to to question you know how to play a scale inside of a piece turn that tight rope from a rope into a 12 foot wide sidewalk where you're not going to fall off yeah and where on your worst day you might stumble on that sidewalk but you're not going to fall off and you're not going to you know kill yourself in tripping exactly yeah um I should uh, point out that if we have more questions, it's a very good time to ask them now, as we are um, sort of... Um, uh, do you recommend playing the same scale of the piece or concerto I'm playing? Uh, okay, I can answer this, but I want you to answer this too. For me, absolutely. Especially so if you are having a difficult time transposing, let's say, a B flat major scale to B major, um, yeah, you, you definitely should do scales in the key of the piece that you're playing, especially if the piece you're playing happens, for example, to be the Sansons Concerto Number no. 3. And if you have problems hearing the second theme of the first movement in B major and not, you know, going out of tune... Gosh, it's, that's an intonation nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Between that and the E flat minor of Scottish Fantasy. Oh, you know, dear God. You know, yeah. the, the thirds that happen um, in E flat major or uh, some of these scales. Absolutely. I think of um, the first page of the Sibelius Concerto Third Movement, which you can have the best day possible, and then you hear bum ba lum ba lum and you think, well, <laughs> what's going to emerge from the instrument today? Um, so actually, that's a really good point, because um, going back to managing one's time well, if you have the fingers that... Um, your first movement of Tchaikovsky is going to go well no matter what you do to try and get in your own way, then it's not something that you have to practice throughout the concert season. Um, if I have Dvorak Concerto on the books, which for me is one of the most awkward things in the, the literature, then I've got to go through the minor key section of the last movement um, that goes from A flat major up to D flat major, and you've got thirds across the strings, and it is really, again, a finger buster, then you've got to work on that throughout the concert year. Um, if I have Sibelius, I might work on the coda to the first movement or the first page of the third movement. If I've got Mendelssohn. Or, or the end of the third, the, the uh, octave leaps. If I've got the Mendelssohn concerto, absolutely getting the third to the fourth to the sixth the way I want them. Um, and it doesn't have to be an hour a day, uh, eight hours a day. It can be 15 minutes. Of yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a reminder. It's a sort of booster shot Yeah. Uh, of, yeah. But I, that's how that's how my mind likes to work, though. You know, I've got um, I've got Mozart five next month, and the Boulogne Saint George double concertos, and um, the Brahms Sonata cycle, and I think of the various passages in each of those pieces. You know, um, in the second movement of the Brahms G Major Sonata, there's an intonation nightmare at the end with getting the perfect fifths and the E flat thirds. And in the Brahms D Minor, you've got string crossings that you want to be as smooth. And is the, the development section of the first movement is, um, yeah, how are you going to bring out the repeated A's rising to the D while doing the string crossings? Yeah. So again, it's all about time management. You know, you're talking about confidence. We can break it down to how are you spending your time practicing? What are you doing apart from the instrument? You know, um, if I'm mowing the lawn or in the garden, I might have the headphones on and I'm listening to different recordings of whatever I'm doing, because that helps with memory. Absolutely. There's there's plenty of uh, performers who will talk about working away from the instrument. And what they mean is listening to fellow performers with a performer's ear, um, getting ideas just by playing the piece in their mind's ear. Um, you're thinking about the piece. You are mentally performing the piece. You're not just repeating the same thing and failing to hear what it is that you've actually played. You know, just this morning, I was on a walk with my husband. And my left hand, it's frightfully cold here in Cleveland, but my left hand is going through the Mozart A major. Wait, wait, let me see your fingerings again. You know, and making sure that I feel the distance in my hand against my palm so that when I get to the violin later, as you said, it's practicing away from the instrument as yeah. well. And, you know, you're while you're doing the, the fingerings, for example, I don't know that you're practicing the accuracy of shifts, but you are practicing finger memory. Absolutely. And sometimes... Um, I, I remember the way that I changed my second theme in the Tchaikovsky Concerto. It happened literally in the shower. I'm humming the second theme, and I suddenly realize that I'm I'm playing it differently than I'm humming it because I was humming. Da -dum, da -da -da -dum, da -dum, da -da -da 
thump ba. Wait a second. I'm doing a lift after the eighth note. Triple a triple a thump ba da 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 da. And all of a sudden, I, I was like, well, why don't I actually do this? But I would not have come up with the idea by playing the thing, right? Although Tchaikovsky, by the way, uh, as you were talking about, uh, as we were talking about muscle memory and, and you're talking about scales, I'm thinking it's one of those pieces specifically, Tchaikovsky. It's one of those pieces where it's not the psychology, it's the physiology. When I'm, I, I can perform the Tchaikovsky literally right now, right? I know the piece well enough that not warmed up, I can stand up and I'm going to play it worse than I would when I'm warmed up. Warmed up, I'm going to play it worse than when I'm, you know, properly in shape. But the thing that's going to kick my butt is that the chaik has a stamina problem beginning from the cadenza onwards. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and if I have, if I'm, if I've been phoning it in, you know, I can phone in Campanella more easily than that because... Um, it takes a lot of physical pacing. It really does. And you cannot... Um... I'm trying to think of a G-rated uh, explanation for this, but you you have to make sure that your stamina can subsist past the cadenza because once the bow goes on the string with those A major chords, it doesn't come off. Until it doesn't come off again until the end of the movie. It's not like, you know, what the Sibelius concerto is actually paced perfectly. Every couple of pages, you get a rest. Gorgeous tootie. That inspires you. Two minutes? Gorgeous tootie. Look at the basis. Yeah, beers later. Coda, take a break. Wins start the second movement. You can pace yourself. Yeah, it's. I think I, I've heard singers complain about this too. There's the the opera where you walk on and you have a couple of warm up arias and then comes your big number versus you know the Flying Dutchman. You walk on uh, and God help you, you know your first number is the, the killer. You you get no warm up. Well, and we owe Oystrak the saving grace of telling Shostakovich. Dima, please give this tooting in the opening of the burlesque in the concerto to the orchestra so that I might mop my brow for 24 bars. <laughs> five and a half minute cadenza where you're beating the hell out of the instrument. He wanted a mere 24 seconds to just mop the brow, make sure the E string is where he wants it, and to replace the shoulder rest because in the original edition, Shostakovich had the solo violin playing. Ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba. Right out of the cadenza. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it does help, of course, when the composer has had a, a chance to converse with the uh, with the performer on the instrument. I was you just know, I wish I could email lvb twenty twenty one at gmail .com and ask him about you know in the Kreitzer Sonata did you mean to do this? <laughs> how, oh, how even in the concerto, there, there's stuff in the concerto that I, I had this conversation after the D'Angelo competition with Franco Gulli. Um, we got into a sort of musician nerd discussion of Beethoven violin concerto uh, bowings. So right before the, the first big 2D, do you play the bowings as marked all separates? Do you mean the scales and 16? Yeah. Yep, up, 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 no. Right. I, because of my mom, I did. I huh. still do. I still think that there's, but I remember Guli looked at me with such pity in his eyes and he went, my dear friend, don't be more Catholic than the Pope. You mean where it goes four 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 five four yes. four, four five four 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 six Three. five? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean it's one of those things where you sort of the threes and the fives. It's like the Barber Concerto scales. We're not going eight plus eight plus eight plus seven plus eight plus six. It's all one big phrase. And if we have to give an agogic accent on the F sharp because there's only seven in that beat instead of eight, then so be it. Yeah, I mean when we get to the to the micro, as we're talking earlier, we have to remember there's 45 more minutes. You know, you're not going to walk through the palace at Versailles and stand in front of one mirror and gaze at it. When you take a dog for a walk, you're not going to stand at each tree from the lift his leg for 10 minutes. You've got places to be. So the momentum always has to keep going. It's a fair, it's a fair argument. I would, I would like to um, play that ending, uh, not the ending, the, Ending of the exposition for you and see if I can convince you otherwise, though. But th this is the the mentality of the performer, right? Um, you say you don't like Ravel. Let me prove to you that you're wrong by playing Ravel at you, you know. Um, or Yasha Heifetz, you, you know, going to Israel in 19, what was it, 55? When he got beaten up. You say that Richard Strauss was a Nazi. Let me yeah. program the Strauss violin sonata for you. Yeah. 
And just like politics, just like politics, the music industry has this pendulum that swings and swings and swings and swings. And, you know, back in the 80s, we thought Nigel Kennedy and Nigel Sloan Sonnenberg, well, maybe not we, but the press dubbed them as the bad boy and the bad yeah. violin. Let me tell you, you put on some of Nadja's, well, there's a clip of her at the Nomberg when she won with the Tchaikovsky. It's fabulous violin playing on any level. And the yeah. other finalists that were in the Nomberg with her have big careers, and rightfully so. And yet we end up with the pendulum swinging. That's how we got the former president. That's how we've got some of the current politicians we do now. And that's why we've got some of these internet sensations. On I, I think it's a reaction. The, yeah, the internet sensations especially. Reaction. You know, Mutter and her uh, Galliano gowns, that was, that offended the puritanical critics of the 1980s. And now it's just a work uniform. That she's I doing. think, you know, there's, there's things that will offend you, that will offend me. Uh, in performance, less so about what the person wears, although sometimes I'm probably more conservative than you, uh, you know, when it comes to that. Uh, but there, there's definitely going to be a performer, uh, performer or performance that offends you because just it, it's, it doesn't go like that. It, you know, that uh, what was it? Verizon commercial. It doesn't work like this. None of this works like this. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's a good thing when there is a uh, when, when you feel strongly enough about something as subjective as music to have a really visceral reaction to, Oh my God, that's disgusting. That makes me angry. I remember calling you after uh, driving home from somewhere uh, because we heard a violinist that, that we both know. I heard a violinist we both know on the radio and that violinist's uh, performance on the radio. I won't even mention the piece he was playing because that might give things away. Um, that violinist's performance made me violently angry. He hadn't injured a family member. He hadn't. Uh, no, it was the third. Ah, oh, okay. Sorry, I had to replay it in my head. Because with the first, you could almost get away with what I heard. But, but it's interesting, you can... though. I mean, you know, these clips that pop up online of these comets, as I like to call them, you know, some might stay around a little bit longer than others, but there is a reason, Mooder and Perlman and Zuckerman and folks have been playing throughout many decades. And we have to remember that. I remember in the discussion at Encore, um, overhearing Mr. Lipset, who of course has had one of the great studios in this country for, for three decades, saying, okay, so you heard violinist A not have a great night. How do you think he sounded when he started? Remember that. And, mm -hmm. and we have to think about how some of these folks have let celebrity or, or income or an RC or, ju or just the pressures of, you know, uh, literally you're talking about a concert three times a week. What if you have eight concerts a week? Yeah. You know, a double show on, on uh, a Saturday, yeah. a matinee and an evening. And uh, because of the musician's personality, it's never, one is never happy with uh, their circumstances that week. You know, if I have three concerts, I remember um, a couple times every season, I have these, ludicrous schedules where I am in Greenville, South Carolina on a Friday, Colorado Springs on a Sunday, Augusta, Georgia on a Tuesday, and then Washington, D.C. on Friday. And you you don't, you don't wake up and you don't know what city you're in. And so then you complain to your significant other. Oh, gosh, I think I'm in Colorado Springs tomorrow. And all I want to do is be at home. COVID happens. <laughs> and you're watching, you know, reruns of the Kardashians and you think, God, do you remember when I was running through O'Hare and I didn't know what and, I was going to? And I had the audacity to be affronted by the fact that I have to run through O'Hare on my way to actually perform music, which I yes. love doing for an audience. Yes. Yeah. Well. Well, we, we're never happy. It's either we are um, Goldilocks, for sure, when it comes to whatever the circumstances are. You know, and I, I've talked to some colleagues who are from the outside, seem to have very privileged existences. And... Um, they seem rarely happy with their situation, whether it's with their manager, um, you know, a certain soloist that I know has never given her manager her cell phone because she doesn't want to be bothered. Um, and then there are others who were so nervous about the rise of Aaron Roseanne and his tremendous sound of virtuosity that they did everything they could to squash a, a career. Um, well, no, I mean, musical politics is the topic for not one, but several podcasts because we are working in an industry that is a, a about subjective judgment. For sure. Um, 
and what rides on that subjective judgment are people's livelihoods, people's yeah. uh, you know means of actually making a living. So, um, and if you can... many things go into concerts. My mentor said to me famously fifteen years ago. He said to me, "Honey Bunny, you're cute as hell, and you play well." But at some point, cracks happen, <laughs> wrinkles occur, you know, weight is gained, whatever it is, gray hairs appear, and you've got to play even better. Because when you're not the rising artist, the young star, the the 18 year old who's the newest thing on the block, when you're 35 and 50 and 75, you've got to have something that is redeemable. Yeah. But the one advantage I think in our industry is that if you do play your cards intelligently, if you um, look at the long game, yeah. If you look at the long game, long if, game. You, if you prep yourself for the long game, uh, a football player is an outlier and incredibly fortunate to play in uh, to to uh, when he's 40 a ballet dancer might be cooked by the time that they're 30. Yeah. um and then you have somebody like you know Karyon conducting until he's whatever 90 and you have somebody like milstein performing until they're you know 85. um if if you build on solid ground you are in this for the duration and okay. and if you express gratitude which is my favorite word, you know, my grandmother who passed away four weeks ago was grateful for That's every insane. moment that she had, you know, and even at the age of 92 and a half, she walked three miles a day because she was grateful for the cold breeze and she was grateful for the chance to rake leaves and live independently, which she was very fortunate to do. And she would say to me, Andrew, I just take things one day at a time. Look at this beautiful day. I'm going to go get myself a slice of Grotto's pizza and sit at Rehoboth Beach. And the amount of gratitude for the little things is a lesson we, we, uh, I certainly need, we all need, you know, I never thought, and Emil, you've known me a long time. I never thought that I would uh, be able to have had the um, opportunities that I've enjoyed. And if you had told me when I was 15, that I would have played the number of concerts that I've been fortunate to have played, I might have laughed in your face. I might have actually laughed and said, there are so many folks who I think could, you know, play louder, faster, whatever. And every time I get the opportunity to make music uh, on a recital series or with an orchestra, I'm filled with gratitude. And I think for 40 minutes, I'm going to try and say something, <laughs> say something that is deserving of the opportunity, the stage, the conductor, the composer, who let's forget, let's not forget, we are only the liaison between composer and audience for the 40 minutes. We are so that's, that's saying we are the actor to the playwright. Exactly. We are a blip on the history of Mozart's fifth final linkage. We're just a blip. It's going to be around 300 years from now and people will play it. But for 28 minutes, let's see how Turkish I can be. If we don't have any further questions, um, do we first of all have any further questions? If anybody uh, has any questions, let's get them now. Uh, but if we don't, um, Andrew, what I would like to sort of wrap by saying is what I started uh, by saying. Um, the insights that you have as uh, a self-employed troubadour, um, they are invaluable to the people who are considering whether this is the job for them um, it, it's of course not just a job, it's, a, it's an identity and a way of life. Um, but I, I first of all thank you for making the time, but mostly I thank you for setting an example uh, for these um, possibly musically infected folk. Sure. You know, it's, it's not about... I, don't, I actually don't know what it's about. You know, it's one of those things where I can't picture myself doing anything else. I can't picture myself sitting in an office. I can't picture myself um, selling homes you're, or selling here. You're not, not a violinist because during COVID, you're not performing live concerts. It's one of those it's your things identity where, regardless of what you're doing. Yeah. You know, there's a certain part of me that, that knows that if I work hard at a piece, that when I play it, there's a reason you play it. And it's bigger than us. It's, you know, I, I will never forget playing in a Hartford, Connecticut, and it was Beethoven eight and nine sonatas and myriad smaller pieces. And just an example of how to keep things uh, 
how to focus on the big picture picture a uh, mother came up to me backstage and she said she was a nicely dressed lady and she said you know this is my first time out at a concert in a couple months i said oh well thank you for spending time with us and she said you know beethoven i came because he's my favorite composer and i said oh thank you ma'am nice to have you here and she said my son is a veteran and he killed himself a month ago when he came back from the middle east and this is the first time I could bring myself to leave the house was because of Beethoven. And my pianist and I were so shaken that on a flight that night, that late night flight back home, we were, I might've been clutching her hand or something. We were so shaken by that comment that it was not about us. It's so much bigger than that. It's about a reason for someone to spend their afternoon with you or their evening with you. And that puts a lot of pressure on us to make sure that the babysitters, and the dinner dates and the parking fees and the effort, the effort of putting on boots and makeup and, and a jacket. And uh, when you've had a tragedy in your family and going out to face the world, it makes it all worth it. Yeah. Well, who was it? I think it was Irina uh, Morisano who pointed out the story of the, the professor um, saying to uh, his musician students, um, that when you go to me medical school, you know that one day somebody will be brought into the ER um, suffering from something that only, you know, you can save them from and their life will be in your hands. But as musicians, uh, we think this doesn't apply to us. And yet it does. Someday somebody will come to you wounded, um, maybe not physically, and uh, entrust their spirit into your hands. Um, and you have to nurture it. You have to care for it. You have to... Uh, you know, take take care of it. For sure. Yeah. Well, that's not a small responsibility on which to uh, <laughs> on which to uh, make a coda. Um, again, Andrew, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you so much for your uh, insight, your expertise. Uh, I hope we can do this again at some point. Well, it's always good to have a conversation, you know, with students and teachers and artists and soloists, chamber musicians, whomever, you know, last stand, second violins, third bassoons. It's just good to have the conversation because we're a united family. You don't have to look like somebody or love like somebody or speak their language, but you get on a stage with them and it is just about making art. Yeah. And, you know, all of my friends, none of my friends are my age. They're either... 40, 50 years older, and they've been doing this longer than I've been live, or they're, you know, starting out their careers. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about this industry is you've got these folks, it doesn't matter the backgrounds or any of the external things. All that matters is that we're coming together because we're putting together the Brahms violin concerto or the, the Brahms sextets, whatever it is. Yeah, it, it is a wonderful um, obligation to be under. And folks, now we have to apply this kind of pressure to Emil so that he can go on tour with the Chernovsky Quartet in about <laughs> 15 years. You've got- I think, I think the fact it. that my children love music but have so far uh, shown no um, burning desire to actually play an instrument, to pretend to play an instrument, sure, but no burning desire to play an instrument. I think this is one of my few uh, accomplishments, successes <laughs> as a father. Well, that's more important than any artistic successes, I think. Hopefully I don't breed serial killers. <laughs> and on that note. On that note. Um, join, uh, join us again next week. Um, the podcasts will be uh, regularly Saturdays at 3 o'clock. Um, and my guest for the next podcast will be announced shortly um, on Kirov Academy's uh, Facebook page and Instagram. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your questions. And thank you, Andrew.